tech companies Thank you, remove Senator posts. Faruqi. The time for this debate has expired. Yeah. Senator Wong. Thank you, President. I seek leave to make a statement concerning ministerial arrangements. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Wong. I advise minister changes to ministerial arrangements uh, due to the budget. Uh, Senator Gallagher will be absent from question time today on account of ministerial business relating to budget arrangements. In Senator Gallagher's absence, I will represent the Minister for Finance, Minister for the Public Service, Minister for Women, Vice President of the Executive Council, Minister for Indigenous Affairs, Cabinet Secretary Treasurer, Minister for Small Business, Assistant Treasurer, and the Minister for Financial Services. Yes, correct. Senator Farrell will represent the Minister for Health and Aged Care, the Minister for Aged Care, and the Minister for Sport. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham, oh, you're ready for your question? We we'll move to questions. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks President. And, uh, and not to disappoint Senator Wong, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. I refer to the Foreign Minister's announcement last Tuesday reversing Australia's recognition of West Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, which was announced with initial denials by the minister's office on the Jewish holy day of Simchat Torah and just two weeks out from polling day in Israeli elections. The Prime Minister has described as, and I quote, deeply regrettable the government's handling of the announcement. He also said that it could have been done better and that it caused distress. Given these acknowledgements of failure, has the Prime Minister spoken with Israeli, Israeli Prime Minister Lapid to apologise for the ham-fisted handling of this matter? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Wong. Thank you, um, President. Uh, and uh, I'm taking the question, I think, is representing the Prime Minister, but I could equally take it as, obviously, as Foreign Minister. Uh, can I, I want to start by saying there are few issues that are more central for uh, members of the Jewish community than the status of Jerusalem. Uh, it is more than a political issue. It's about history, it's about faith, faith and it's about identity. Uh, it's at the heart of Israel's origins and its future, and importantly, there can be no lasting peace, no lasting peace that does not address its status. Uh, its sensitivity and the status of Jerusalem is, 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 sensitive, is so sensitive that for the overwhelming majority of the international community, it has remained a final status issue to be resolved as part of any peace negotiations between Israel and Palestinian peoples. Uh, now, what the government has done is to reaffirm Australia's previous long-standing and bipartisan position of that fact that Jerusalem is a final status issue that should be resolved as part of any peace negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian people. And I would remind the chamber that, notwithstanding some of the commentary, uh, this has been Australia's position for decades. This was not changed by the Gorton government following the Six-Day War. It was not changed by Malcolm Fraser, Bob Hawke, John Howard, uh, or Malcolm Turnbull. Regrettably, there was one exception which uh, occurred um, during the period of the Morrison government, a period in which um, the uh, shadow minister uh, was a member of the cabinet. And we know why that was, because he thought he could gain political advantage uh, by announcing uh, recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and relocating our um, embassy. Senator Birmingham. President, a point of order. The minister has provided uh, one minute and 52 seconds of context for her answer. The sole question uh, was whether the Prime Minister of Australia, Mr Albanese, has spoken with Israeli Prime Minister Lapid to apologise for the handling of the matter. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. There was um, a, also a preamble to that question that mentioned holy days and um, so on, and it mentioned the capital of West Jerusalem. So I'll listen carefully to the remainder of uh, the minister's questions, and I will draw her attention to the question if necessary. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Uh, the minister, Shadow Minister, also talked about uh, the phrase "deeply regrettable." I think those are my words, and I've said that publicly. Um, Thank you, Senator Wong. The time has expired. Uh, Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, before the election, the then Shadow Attorney General, Mr Dreyfus, assured the Australian Jewish community there was no difference between the government, the Labor Party, uh, and the opposition, and now the Liberal and National Party's positions on Israel. As late as last Monday, the Foreign Minister's Office denied any change of position to media, to Jewish community representatives and uh, to Israel's embassy. Why did the government mislead the government Israel and the Australian Jewish community groups on this decision? 
Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, well, first, uh, if I can just finish this point, uh, I think the Shadow Minister does know, and the Chamber does know, that Mr Morrison changed decades of bipartisan position in relation to this matter for the Wentworth by-election. That's the context of it. And I, I want to make this clear. You know, the, we made very clear, uh, in fact, if you look at what I said in 2018, we not only opposed uh, what Mr Morrison had done, uh, I made clear that I would, we would be reversing it. This is you know, in the 2018 context of the 28 decision. Mr. Shorten, uh, as leader, uh, we agreed that we would reverse this position uh, should Labor form government. Uh, I would hope uh, that uh, we and we made clear prior to the last election that Jerusalem uh, is a final status issue. And the reality is there can be no lasting peace that does not address the status of Jerusalem, uh, and we ought not be supporting you, an approach Senator that undermines Wong, your time this has prospect. expired. Um, Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, will the government join with Labor MP Josh Burns in apologising to Australia's Jewish community, and will efforts be made to apologise to the government of Israel? Further, will the government guarantee, consistent with the pre-election statements of Mr Burns and Mr Dreyfus, that it will make no further unilateral changes to Australia's position on matters relating to Israel and the Palestinian people. Minister. Thank you. Uh, I have said publicly uh, that the timing of the announcement falling as it did on Simchat Torah was deeply regrettable. Uh, I've said so publicly and I've said so in private. Uh, uh, and we, we remain, uh, that, it, that, is, that is my view. Uh, in relation to uh, in relation to uh, Israel, uh, we, I, will tell, I will be clear, and I, I have uh, made sure that the ambassador is, uh, is aware that I indicate this in the chamber. I have met with the ambassador, uh, and we had a very constructive engagement. Uh, and uh, what I would say uh, is that we both agree that Australia and Israel have a long and enduring friendship, uh, which we will both seek to strengthen. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Grogan. Uh, my question is to the uh, Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Uh, can the Minister ups update the Senate on Labor's responsible approach to budgeting and how tonight's budget will start the job of budget repair? Thank you, Senator Grogan. Minister Wong. Well, I thank Senator Grogan for her question. Uh, well, uh, tonight we will see a Labor Treasurer hand down a Labor budget, putting yeah. down putting down the foundations uh, of what this government looks to achieve for the Australian people, for the Australian people over this term. Uh, it will be a responsible budget. It will be a budget that is right for the times, and it will be a a budget which seeks to ready the country for the future. Now, those opposite yeah. were the most wasteful government since right. Federation. Yeah, the most wasteful government since yeah, Federation, yeah. overseeing successive budgets riddled with rocks and slush funds, Order. slush funds and weighed down of waste. They left us with a trillion dollars in debt, but with nothing to show for it. It, it hurts them, doesn't it? It hurts them, doesn't it? You know, they, they like to pretend they're the party of sound economic management. They left Australians with a trillion dollars in debt, with, of and debt Senator and so Wong. little to show for Senator it. Senator they spent. Thank you. Order on both sides of the chamber. Calling out across the chamber is disorderly. And Senator Wong has the right to be heard in silence. Yeah. Minister. Oh, sorry. Did she call me again? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. They spent five and a half billion dollars on submarines we will never see. Nineteen point seven billion dollars in JobKeeper payments to companies with rising revenues. And they spent billions buying votes from slush funds. Senator buying Wong. votes from slush Senator funds Wong. targeting coalition Senator or marginal Wong. seats. I Senator see the Wong. Minister for the Colour Coded Spreadsheets is interjecting. The Minister for Colour Coded Spreadsheets is interjecting. Do Why don't you seat. tell us about it? Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Resume your seat, Senator McKenzie. I asked you to resume your seat. When I call the chamber to order and then ask the minister to continue with her answer, I do not expect everyone in the chamber to start shouting and yelling out across the chamber. It is disorderly. And the minister needs respect, and I certainly need respect when I call you to order, Minister. 
Minister. Do you wish Senator McKenzie uh, resume your seat, Senator McKenzie, please? Senator McGrath, I have just finished asking for respect. I, I beg your pardon. Seriously, Senator McKenzie. Madam President, I draw your attention to the standing orders. Ministers need to, instead of screaming at shadow ministers across the chamber, in answering questions, need to go through the uh, chair. Senator McKenzie, you would be well aware that I have called the chamber, both sides, to order twice. Minister, please continue. Thank you, um, President. The Albanese government's first budget will begin the difficult task of budget repair after inheriting a budget in structural deficit and weighed down with record levels of debt, debt which is becoming even more expensive to service. The debt, you, the interest payments on, on, the, on the coalition's debt, one of the fastest growing pressures on the budget. Now, we have spent our first months in office delivering on our promise to undertake an audit of spending, an audit of spending going through the budget to identify where money could be returned or redirected to more quality spending, and you will see the results of that tonight. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Grogan, first supplementary. Can the minister update the Senate on the state of the budget that this government inherited? Minister. As we know, those opposite doubled the debt before the pandemic, That's right. before the pandemic and have left the Australian people with debt, with a trillion dollars in debt with so little to show for it. But most importantly, and Australians came to understand this, they treated taxpayers' money like it was Liberal or National Party right. money, trying to buy votes instead of building value for the country. Now, since coming into government, what we know is that the global economic environment is significantly more volatile Senator than it was McKenzie. just a few months ago. Whether it's cost, uh, global challenges uh, weighing on household budgets and the economy, as are cost of living pressures which have resulted as a consequence. We have also seen, as I said before, the cost of servicing government de debt increase. In fact, revisions in the cost of interest payments on your debt as well as the NDIS, are also placing pressure on the budget, unrelated to any policy Thank decision you, Minister, of the your government. Time has expired. Senator Grogan, second supplementary. Can the minister outline to the Senate how Labor's approach of responsible budgeting contrasts with the Liberal and Nationals' budget mismanagement? Minister. Thank you, President. Thank you to Senator Grogan. Well, it, the fact is, in a time of extreme global volatility and uncertainty. In a time of rising inflation, the nation, one of the best defences the nation can deploy is a responsible budget. A responsible budget, and that is what you will see tonight from Treasurer Chalmers uh, and Finance Minister Gallagher. Uh, our response to revenue upgrades will mean the budget bottom line will be uh, that debt will be lower than previously forecast. There's less, there will be less debt than the Liberals, but more to show for it. Uh, and despite what those opposite might say, they did not leave the budget in a, quote, strong or improving position. <laughs> they did not. So tonight's budget, we, we have had, the government has had to work to find room for billions of dollars of pressures left in the budget and legacy spending that you failed to provision for. It will be, we have engaged in responsible decision making required to make room for the things Thank that you, matter. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Senator Wong, and follows revelations reported yesterday by Sky News that the Australian energy regulator has warned the Albanese government that power prices will rise by up to 50 per cent next year. Even Labor's own budget tonight reportedly concedes that there will be a price rise of between 30 and 40 per cent. Minister, will you now admit that Labor's election promise made 97 times during the campaign Two Australians that their power bills will be cut by $275 annually will never be delivered. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Senator Watt. Uh, sorry, Minister, Minister Wong. Thank you, President. Well, uh, I think there is no doubt uh, we all know that Australians are grappling with the impact of rising energy costs. Australian households, Australian business, Australian industry. 
Uh, and those opposite might like to uh, push this aside, but uh, the world is dealing with the most significant shock to energy markets in 50 years due to Russia's prolonged attack on Ukraine. And Russia's willingness to weaponise energy has caused havoc in global markets, and it has sent coal and gas prices through the roof. Domestically, what else are we dealing with? Well, a decade of denial and chaos Order. in energy policy, which show four gigawatts of dispatchable energy exit the system. And guess how much come to, came in under you? One. One. So not only have we got a global econo economic shock, a global shock to energy markets, we are dealing with a decade in which you ensured supply exited the market. Uh, Minister Wong, That's please, the reality. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Henderson. Um, President, thank you. I just ask you to remind Senator Wong to direct her comments through the chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. Henderson, I will remind the minister to direct her comments to the chair. Thank Enjoy you. looking at Senator Dunningham so much. You know, we have a nice exchange across the chamber. He's, you know, order. No, we, 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 uh, he's, one, he's one of the people on that side I have some regard for, and, and, he, and he's always he's always happy to uh, to have a chat across the chamber. But uh, if, if it offends people, I will turn this way. If they prefer me to talk to you, it's fine. Uh, as I said. Uh, we are dealing with uh, energy prices which are uh, rising much faster than were ever anticipated because of the significant shock to energy markets, the weaponisation of energy by Russia, uh, which has caused havoc in the global markets, <coughs> and also uh, a decade of chaos, which has seen so much dispatchable capacity leave the system and only one gigawatt enter to replace losses. Thank you, uh, Minister. Sen uh, Senator Dunningham, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Didn't mention $275 once. Yeah, On October the 10th, a Linter Energy CEO, Je Jeff Dimery, said, what cost me $1 billion to acquire is going to cost me $8 billion to replace. So let's talk about that and explain to me how energy prices still come down. Yet a Labor Party source claimed yesterday the Russia-Ukraine conflict was responsible for these massive power price increases. Who's correct, the Labor source blaming the conflict from well before the election, or Mr Dimery, one of our foremost energy experts? Thank you, Senator Dunia. Minister Wong. Well, uh, I think I've actually answered uh, that substantively in my first question, which pointed to the various factors which are driving energy costs. And you, you, might, like, you might like to pretend that the government and the country are not trying to grapple with, just as every, every country in the world is. If you talk to Germany about what is occurring for energy in relation to energy prices, you will see we are not the only government or the only people who are, who are having to grapple with rising energy costs. But what the, one, the one fact that those opposite just cannot accept, and it is this, renewables are cheaper. Renewables are cheaper. Renewables are cheaper, and the fact that you, in fact, is that, that you're allergic to that fact. You know, the fact that you were allergic to that fact, and you spent so many years fighting each other because you didn't want to accept the facts, uh, is in part why Australia is in the position that it, it is in. Thank you, Minister. Senator Dunningham, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, in view of these huge increases in energy prices, alongside all the other cost of living increases Australians are experiencing, and in the face of a refusal to back in the promise to cut power bills by $275 annually, what does your modelling show about how many Australians will suffer energy poverty under your government's policies? Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Minister Wong. Well, what, what I can say to you is, is this government uh, will deal responsibly uh, with the mess in energy markets that we inherited from you. And unlike you, our response is not going to be to try and hide price increases. Let's remember your great response, your great response, the, the, those opposite, the, co the coalition's great response to rising energy costs on their watch was Mr Taylor making sure it was hidden from the election, uh, hidden from the electorate before the election. So I can tell Order. you this, we will go about trying to deal with uh, the cost increases that uh, the result in great part from the shock to global energy markets and the mess in the energy markets Order. responsibly Order. and sensibly. And we are going to do Senator it in a McGrath. way 
Uh, we are going to do it in a way that actually tries to reform energy markets. You have already seen that. You have already seen that with the Marinus link uh, that Thank was you, announced Minister, your time uh, just expired. last weekend. Senator Cox. I rise to ask a question to the minister representing the Minister for Environment and Water, Minister Wong. Uh, CSIRO recently provided a fracking fact sheet in English, and it was then translated in language into audio files and provided to First Nations communities. Providing this fact sheet was one of the recommendations of the Northern Territory Fracking Inquiry. This misleading fact sheet was produced by a division that is partially funded by the gas industry, which includes Origin and Santos. And it stated that methane may play a role in climate change when we know that it definitely plays a role. In fact, methane is 80 times more potent than CO2, and at least 25 per cent of the global warming is driven by methane from human actions. My question is, why are fossil fuel companies allowed to fund, in any pro proportion, divisions of a government agency, our scientific peak body that is expected to provide independent advice, especially regarding a controversial topic these companies have a direct interest in? Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister Wong. Uh, uh, thank you, President, uh, and thank you to Senator Cox for the question. I'm sure she's unsurprised to know this is not necessarily something of which I have direct first-hand knowledge. Uh, I, uh, so I haven't seen the fracking fact sheet to which she has referred. Uh, nor, but if she is referring in relation to the partial funding that she described to CSIRO and industry partnerships, which I think has been uh, in uh, the media for, for some time, I, I would make the point uh, that the CSIRO, uh, which of course is an essential pillar uh, of Australia's national science infrastructure, a great institution responsible for some you know, enormous advances. Uh, in, in research uh, and very good liaison and engagement with the members of the Australian community. Now, it is part of CSIRO's mission to work with industry. It's part of CSIRO's mission to work with industry. So I don't know if what the, the senator is complaining about, or sorry, I wasn't trying to minimise it, uh, referencing uh, is, is one of the industry partnerships. Uh, if she wants to give me more information about that, uh, I will uh, be very, very happy to provide that. But if this is uh, a, a reaction to the CSIRO working with industry, we've, we've taken the view in government, uh, and I did as, as climate minister many years ago, uh, that it is a good thing for those at the forefront of research both into climate science and into the response to climate change, how we deal with it, to work closely with industry. You know, industry has to be part of the solution. No, they're not just not, not just you know, yelled at, uh, and in fact, industry uh, where we have done well as a country on energy, when we have done well as a country uh, on renewable energy, it has been where governments and industry have worked together, and the regulatory structure uh, has incentivised industry to do the right thing. Thank you, Minister. Senator Cox, first supplementary. First Nations communities have long stated their opposition to fracking on their land. Presenting them with this misleading information is outright offensive to their intelligence as traditional owners. Will CSIRO redo the fact sheet with accurate information about the risks of fracking for gas, including the impacts on me of methane on climate change, to ensure that First Nations communities are not misled and so they are able to adequately be informed of the activities that are uh, proposed on their country. Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, um, President. Uh, can I also uh, just perhaps add to some of the answer, uh, which was I understand that the, the member for Lingiari uh, has um, raised uh, issues in relation to, and I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce this acronym. Is it Jazeera? Thank you. <laughs> Program uh, with uh, Minister Husick, uh, and I think, uh, ha and has indicated public that this matter has been rectified. Uh, I will go and you know, I will ask uh, my office to liaise with Senator M Minister Husick's office uh, about this issue uh, and see if I can provide a little more information about how that was resolved. But uh, it's just been alerted, given, uh, brought to my attention that Ms. Scrimgeour did uh, raise this with Minister Husick. Thank you, Minister. Senator Cox, second supplementary. When will the Labor government listen to the climate science and commit to no, no new coal and gas projects and stop allowing these companies to buy social licence and continue their ventures of state capture, all the while um, 
without the free, prior and informed consent of First Nations communities. Um, before I call Minister Wong, um, I'm really struggling to see how that is a supplementary, um, but it's really up to Senator Wong whether she answers it or not. Senator Wong. Uh, look, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer as best I can. Um, uh, in Order. Did Please you continue, want to say Minister something? Wong. Um, I'm happy to answer as best I can. Um, uh, in relation to, uh, I think, the long-standing assertion from the Greens about uh, energy, uh, coal and gas projects, uh, I'd make the point again uh, that I have on multiple occasions in this place that any such approvals would be subject to existing environmental and regulatory frameworks. I would also make the point. I would also make the point. I just know you want. I know you want to get some political differentiation on this, but I would also make the point. This is not how the world. This is not how the world deals with. Uh, a global agreement on, to deal with climate change. The way the world deals with it uh, is by ensuring over time the use uh, of fossil fuels and the use uh, of, of technologies which uh, are highly carbon polluting is reduced. And we have signed up to an ambitious platform and we intend to deliver Thank you, it. Minister. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator David Poke, uh, sorry, Senator Giacomi. Thank you very much, President. And my question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Watt. Uh, Minister, I note with concern the devastating impact that floods are having on so many Victorians throughout my state. Could you please update the Senate on the current flood and severe weather situation affecting not just Victoria, but also New South Wales, Tasmania and Queensland? Thank you, Senator Giacconi. Minister Watt. Uh, thanks, Madam President, and thanks, Senator Giacconi. I know you speak for many people on both sides of this chamber with your level of concern about these floods. Uh, as senators will be aware, Australia is now seeing the impact of a third consecutive La Nina, with flooding impacting many communities across the country. Over the last few weeks, we've seen flooding across Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, Tasmania and now South Australia. And the sad reality is that this dangerous weather is far from over. Of immediate concern is the heavy rainfall that has impacted northeast New South Wales in the past 24 hours, with the front now moving down the coast towards eastern Victoria. There are multiple emergency warnings current across both Victoria and New South Wales right now, and my message to people in those states is please listen to the authorities and heed their warnings and advice. We've already tragically seen six fatalities as a result of these recent floods, and we don't want to see more. Last week, the Prime Minister and I visited the communities of Bendigo, Deloraine, Latrobe, Launceston and Forbes, where we met with a range of first responders and impacted farmers and communities. I also visited Seymour in central Victoria with Victorian Minister Jacqueline Symes and the local federal MP Sam Burrell, and held an online community forum with leaders from across Shepparton to hear from these communities directly. I've also been in regular contact with many other affected MPs from across all sides of the political divide. While these floods have been devastating for many, there has been some positive news along the way. During our time in Tasmania, uh, the Prime Minister and I visited Michael Perkins' dairy farm along with Senator Urquhart. During the 2016 floods, the Perkins family lost 48 heifers from their La Trobe dairy farm. I was heartened to hear that through improvements to warning systems, Michael was able to prepare earlier, ultimately keeping all of his animals safe. And that was something I heard throughout Tasmania. We're thinking of all the communities impacted by these events. We know this repeated, relentless flooding is tough and we'll be there to support people now and as they recover. Thank you, Senator Watt. Uh, Senator Giacconi, first supplementary. Thank you again, President. Minister, since the beginning of these natural or hazard events, what assistance has the federal government provided to these communities impacted by the floods? Minister. Uh, thanks, Senator Giacconi. As a government, we are standing with our state and territory counterparts, along with local governments and communities, supporting all of those governments to respond to the particular needs of local communities. As of 5 p.m. yesterday, our government has activated the 13-week disaster recovery allowance payment for this event across 17 council areas in Tasmania, 46 council areas in Victoria and 43 council areas in New South Wales. This provides some income relief for those eligible people who have lost income due to the floods. 
We have also activated the Australian Government Disaster Recovery Payment in 30 council areas across Tasmania and Victoria, providing one-off payments to eligible adults and children. On top of this, we are also working with the states to deliver joint support to help with clean-up, as well as specialised grants for impacted small businesses and primary producers. I am certainly aware of the significant impact these floods have had on farmers and the infrastructure they rely on to get product to market. We will continue to work with all levels of government across Australia to ensure people get the help they need. Thank you, Senator. What, uh, Senator Ciccone, second supplementary. Uh, Minister, what other support has been provided by the federal government to help communities with their response and recovery efforts? Minister Watt. Uh, thanks, Madam President. When I spoke to people in Seymour nine days ago, the biggest message they had was the need to get recovery support in quickly. They told me very clearly that any delay in starting their clean-up would lead to longer-term issues. The SES in every state do an excellent job, but this is a big event over a long period of time. So after consultation with the Defence Minister, I have approved requests for up to 600 ADF personnel across Victoria and New South Wales uh, at the request of those state governments. Our fantastic Defence Forces have been doing an outstanding job, helping with sandbagging, evacuations and now supporting clean-up operations, damage assessments and the provision and resupply of essential food and supplies to isolated communities. We have also approved the use of ADF helicopters in both New South Wales and Victoria uh, for everything from mass evacuations, if needed, to lifting heavy equipment. I want to thank the ADF for making these personnel and resources available and, of course, thank those boots on the ground for their efforts in helping these communities recover. Uh, I know very well the morale booster thank provides you, to Mr. communities. Your time has expired. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher, represented by Minister Wong. Uh, the government has said that today's budget is all about delivering on your election commitments. One of those commitments was a commitment to uh, it was a commitment to, and I quote, protecting the rights for small business, including ensuring security of payment in the building and construction industry. This is something of concern here in the ACT and across the country. Subcontractors miss out time and again on payments for work done. So my question to the government is when will you act to implement the recommendations of, of the Murray Review from 2017? Thank you, Senator David Pocock. Uh, Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Senator Pocock for the question. Uh, and I again... Uh, oh, that's good, isn't it? Isn't that nice? Cooperation. It's called cooperation. How about that? Order. How about that? Order. Um, Order. Uh, Senator Watt. Uh, I am. I am. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Order. Uh, Order. Please uh, continue, Minister. I, I thank Senator Pocock for the question. Uh, we all know that you know the the enormous economic contribution small businesses make to the Australian economy, and more import as importantly, they're the hearts of the heart of local communities across the country. They employ millions of Australians, and they contribute more than four hundred billion dollars to the nation, or four hundred thirty billion dollars to the nation's economy uh, every year. Uh, in addition, uh, we all we we know firsthand uh, the extent to which uh, COVID. COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic and associated um, lockdowns uh, and you know, what occurred through many cities and towns, how, how hard that hit many uh, small businesses. Um, uh, I, I will see if we can get uh, more information in relation to the 2017 report to which you refer, uh, but I will uh, uh, say that there are a number of measures that the government has already put in place, uh, $18.6 million to help support small businesses adapt and build resilience through digital technology. Uh, small businesses will also have access to new tax incentives to train and upskill employees and improve their digital and tech capacity uh, uh, under uh, uh, reforms to be legislated by the government. Uh, the technology investment boost and skill, uh, skills and training boost would be backdated to 29th March so that small business owners can receive the, Thank you, their, Minister. Your time has full expired. benefits. Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the Electrical Trade Union has said, and again I quote, too many workers and subbies are being left in limbo through no fault of their own. Delivering security of payments will simply create a better, fairer industry where subbies can rely on the commitments made to them and the employees can have certainty that their job will be there tomorrow. 
Does the minister agree with this? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister. Uh, well, I, I think we would all agree that if people uh, are owed money, those contracts, uh, unless it is impossible for obviously issues of solvency, those contracts should be honoured. Uh, I think that you know, I think that would be a, <laughs> a, a fairly logical approach to um, uh, how you might address looking at uh, contractual requirements. Uh, I. I uh, would say that we, uh, and I, I, I have a brief that tells me about unfair contract terms. Uh, I am unsure, uh, and I'm afraid uh, I haven't been able to ascertain the extent to which that applies to the particular factual circumstance the senator outlines. But I would say we've introduced legislation to make unfair contract terms illegal, so that small businesses. Small businesses can negotiate fair agreements with larger partners. This is an issue which has been raised over the many years, uh, the disparity in uh, negotiating power between uh, large, big Thank business you, and small business. Your time has expired. Senator Canavan. I oh, beg your pardon. Sorry, Senator Pocock. Second supplementary. Thank you, President, and thank you, Minister. Uh, on Thursday, the government will move to introduce legislation abolishing the already defunded ABCC. Uh, don't you think ensuring subbies are paid is a more urgent legislative reform? It's building track. Minister. Uh, I'll answer what I'm able to. I'm not sure I th the extent to which it's supplementary. Uh, uh, I know that Senator Pocock has. Um, taken a different view, a view closer to the coalition on this, uh, but I think the abolition of the ABCC was very clear to Australians when they voted for the Albanese Labor government, uh, and we have been clear why. Uh, we don't think there should be um, two sets of laws for workers in this country, and uh, it has been uh, it is wrong to say that the ABCC was able to deal with a whole range of criminal matters. We know those matters are dealt with by the criminal law. So our position in relation to that has been clear and it has been articulated publicly ahead of the election. Thank you, uh, Minister. That's it for you, Senator Pocock. Uh, Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Minister, on the 22nd of January 2019, Anthony Albanese put out a press release titled Rockhampton Ring Road, a certainty under Labor. The Rockhampton Ring Road is the biggest infrastructure project in regional Queensland and it is already out to tender. Yesterday, the ABC reported that the $800 million earmarked by the coalition for the Ring Road project has been put off for a few years. Local businesses have contacted me and the member for Capricorn, Michelle Landry, furious with this broken promise from the Prime Minister. Mr Albanese's comment that it was a certainty had encouraged many local businesses to spend thousands of dollars on their tender applications. Minister, is the only certainty that Australians can bank on from this government is that it will break its promises? Thank you, Senator Canavan. Minister. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, and I've seen some of the social media by Senator Canavan on this, and I would make I, 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 well, yes, you know, avidly, avidly. I particularly liked you and your high vis vest in your backyard, right? Yeah, yeah. I thought that was great. Fake hide Yeah, it was like Fake very hider. dangerous backyard you've got. Clearly, I should have put that on when we were doing the kids trampoline. Order. But anyway. Order. Senator very, McAllister. Very, very risky backyard there. Anyway, um, I, I understand. Uh, I'll make this point. First, the government is committing. Uh, 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 Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Bant. Oh, sorry. Beg your pardon. Sorry. My bad. Obviously, I. My bad. Yes. Sorry. Obviously, my glasses need renewing. My apologies. I thought you were. I thought you were someone from the other place, and I'm sorry to have interrupted you, Minister. Please continue. Uh, I will make the point, uh, and uh, obviously the Minister is actually being Minister for Infrastructure is being represented by Sen. Yeah, no, that's fine. I'm just uh, that, I'm answering Senator the question. Canavan, I'm just trying to be question. helpful. 
Senator Canavan. That obviously, Senator Watt, Watt, Watt is more across this than I would be. I understand in that relation to that particular project, it is, it is incorrect to assert that it is being cut. Uh, it is the case uh, that those opposite, as was uh, the habit of the Morrison government did a lot of announcements without making sure that those announcements could actually be delivered. Uh, and you know, it is an extraordinary thing, isn't it, to have a government that actually wants to make sure when you announce projects you um, are Minister funding Wong, them in a way that seat. can make sure. Minister Wong, thank you, uh, Senator Canavan. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, this is a point of order on relevance. Uh, the question is about a statement that the Prime Minister made. It is about uh, the, the article about the government's agenda, but all I have heard from Senator Wong uh, is to blame no the previous to government you, here. She is insulting the businesses of Central Queen. Please resume. Senator Canavan, please resume your seat. I remind senators, if you are rising on a point of order, the point of order is short and sharp and does not have commentary. Senator, uh, Minister, Watt, uh, Minister Wong is being relevant. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. I was trying to explain uh, what was occurring in relation uh, to the project in question. We have reviewed projects in the infrastructure program to better align investment with cap market capacity, consulting with states and the territories through this process. This is what responsible mother, this is what most responsible Order. governments do. Order. I would be very clear. I understand that the $823 million for Rockhampton Ring Road remains in the budget. Right. Remains in the budget. Right. But unlike the former government, we're actually being upfront about project delivery timelines. That's the responsible thing to do. Senator McKenzie, you can yell all you like, but an announcement is not uh, delivery. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. I remind you, Senator McKenzie, calling out across the chamber is. Uh, Senator McKenzie, it does not require commentary. I am drawing you to order. Senator Canavan. Thank you, um, Madam President. This next question is on behalf of those businesses, so it might be useful if the senator did not yell at them from here in Canberra. As I mentioned, those people, those mum and dad businesses, have spent thousands of dollars on the words of the now Prime Minister that this was a certainty. Uh, what do you propose they do now, Minister Wong, given they haven't been able to rely on the words of the Prime Minister? Minister. I'm asked about uh, local businesses, and I understand that the local business uh, organisation Capricorn Enterprise, in fact, warned you, warned, you right. warned the former government there weren't enough construction tradies to fill the infrastructure yep. pipeline. Right 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 so, so, but you ignored it. I mean, this is the problem with the government. Senator Wong, with the gov Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Canavan, I haven't called you. I am calling the chamber to order. When the minister is trying to answer the question, there needs to be silence. Senator Canavan. Uh, Madam President, on, on relevance, again, as I, as I mentioned, this question was about the businesses in the local area and what they've spent. Again, again, the uh, Prime Minister is talking about the former Canavan. government. That is clearly Senator not relevant. Senator Canavan, you've called the point of order. The last time you stood and called a point of order, order, order on my right. The first point of order you called, I asked you for no commentary and you've completely ignored me and there was commentary again. I do believe that Minister Wong is being relevant. I will listen carefully, Minister. So, uh, well, I think Senator Canavan seems to be asserting that Capricorn Enterprise, the business chamber, is irrelevant to a question about business. Well, maybe you should explain that to, to them, Senator Canavan. The, the reality is uh, we, the, the, budget, the money remains in the budget for that project. There are over 700 regional budget commitments tonight, no matter the scare campaign from those opposite. Right. The reality is, as with so much uh, in the modern Liberal Party and modern National Party, they think when they announce Order. something they've delivered Order. it. You think when you you've announced something, right. you delivered it. The reality is you couldn't deliver and you weren't actually Thank interested you, in doing what you had to do to deliver it. Uh, order. I have a senator on his feet waiting for silence to be called. Senator Canavan, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Minister, 
The Prime Minister has broken his promise to reduce power bills by $275 a year. He's broken his promise on methane emissions from cattle. And now he is breaking his promise on to fund infrastructure. Why is the Prime Minister so gutless that he could not be upfront with uh, the Australian Senator people Canavan, about his plans Senator before they Canavan, voted for him? I, uh, I ask you to withdraw that comment. What? <laughs> Senator Canavan. I, uh, you made a slur against the Prime Minister. I ask Senator Canavan, it's not a debating point. Can I, can I um, ask you to reflect on that ruling, um, uh, Madam President, because I have heard much worse in Senator this chamber. Canavan, I did not reflect on the Prime Minister's Senator uh, Canavan, his, I've uh, asked you to withdraw. I, I expect you to withdraw. I will, re I will withdraw and reword the question. Can I have that opportunity? And could I ask that you do reflect on that decision? I'm happy decision? to reflect. Thank you uh, very thank much. Thank you for withdrawing. Because it seems a little inconsistent. Uh, so, have I got a full clock? Uh, have... Senator Canavan, just resume your seat for a moment, please. Order. I would ask all senators in this place to be respectful. Senator Canavan, I will give you the opportunity to rephrase that question. Uh, we, I'm happy to reset the clock, but I would ask you, when I give my directions, to stop re responding. You're not in a debate with me. So please continue. The, uh, Minister, the Prime Minister has broken his promise to reduce power bills by $275 a year. He's broken his promise on methane emissions from cattle, and now he is breaking his promise to fund infrastructure. Why has the Prime Minister not had the courage to be upfront with the Australian people about his plans before they voted for him. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Minister Wong. Well, uh, you know. Order, <laughs> order on my right. Actually, uh, the Prime Minister is a man of courage and a man of authenticity. Uh, and, and, and those opposite might not like, might not like that fact. You might not like that fact. But that's True. what he is. That's what he is. Uh, and no amount of coming in here and asking you know, such. I mean, really, Senator Canavan, if you want to give a, a, a speech, why don't you just give a speech? I mean, that's not even a question here in question time, is it? It's just a, a little bit of diatribe, trying to get a little bit of you know, uh, invective up in the chamber. It's not actually seeking any information. Uh, is which is what question time should be. Uh, we've made, I've made clear 700 regional project budget commitments tonight uh, that relate to the regions, uh, which includes $9.6 billion of election commitments for infrastructure. Uh, the project to which uh, thank you, Senator Canavan refer has refers expired. remains in the budget. Good. Thank you. Uh, Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Madam President. My question is for the Minister for Emergency Management, Minister Watt. Minister, you said this week that you're talking to the, to the Defence Minister about the need for a standby emergency response workforce to clean up after the fires and floods across the country. I am with you on that, but I can assure you we are flying by the seat of our pants when it comes to a national emergency, re national emergency, re emergency response in this country when dealing with national disasters. So I'm just uh, wondering exactly what you've been speaking to the Defence Minister about. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Watt. Uh, thanks, Madam President, and thanks, Senator Lambie, for your interest in this issue. Obviously, North West Tasmania, an area you're very, very familiar with, uh, has experienced floods over the last couple of weeks, so these issues are very topical uh, in that part of the world. Uh, it has been reported, actually now a number of times, that our government is giving consideration to how we as a country should properly resource disaster management, both in terms of the immediate response uh, and the longer term recovery. Uh, I think the reality that we're all seeing unfold before our eyes is that climate change is here. We are seeing more regular, more frequent, more intense natural disasters, and we haven't been well enough prepared uh, as a country. Uh, and frankly, the federal government hasn't been well enough prepared in the past either. And this is one example of that. So I have begun some discussions with the defence minister, along with other colleagues and a range of non-profit groups, about how we can make sure that as a country we do have uh, effectively the workforce, whether it be paid or volunteer, to cope with the size of the task that we are now facing. 
Even what we're uh, facing at the moment, and this is just in October, uh, I've already updated the Chamber about the number of ADF personnel we've activated across Victoria and New South Wales. And they, of course, supplement the many hundreds and even thousands of SES personnel, paid emergency services workers, volunteers and other groups as well, which again shows the size of the task. Um, this work that we're undertaking is at a very early stage. Uh, we are open to a range of options about how we meet uh, the future workforce needs. The point about the ADF, and I mentioned this in my earlier answer, is that um, quite apart from the incredible practical difference they make on the ground, helping people clean up and recover from disasters. They do provide an enormous morale boost to communities when the trucks roll in, uh, but the reality is we do need to make sure that we don't stretch them too far when they do have a core job being protecting the nation as well. Thank you, Senator Watts. Senator Lambie, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, President. Minister, the ADF has said that disaster cleanup is becoming a distraction from their main job, which is to protect the country. We're not going to set up this new workforce overnight, and we know that our third La Nina period is going to happen over summer. So, what provisions, if any, are in today's budget that will set up an emergency response for workforce, or are we not there yet? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Watt. Um, thanks, Madam President and Senator Lambie. Of course, Senator Lambie, uh, this being my first budget participating as a minister, I'm not about to give away details of the Treasurer's budget. Um, but, but, but what I can say is there are going to be some very strong commitments in this, the disaster management uh, space tonight. Uh, you may be aware that we uh, made an election commitment to provide uh, a grant to Disaster Relief Australia, a veteran-led volunteer organisation that you're no doubt familiar with. Uh, and uh, we're fighting hard to make sure that we deliver that commitment. Uh, but, uh, of course, any work that the federal government does in this space is to supplement the, the leadership role that states and territories play. Um, we don't want to come in over the top of states and territories. We want to supplement them with ADF resources, uh, volunteer organisations and a range of NGOs as well. Um, unfortunately, the, the former government had Senator 10 years Davey. to get these things right. They didn't. We're now here, and now we're trying to fix their mess in this space, as we are in so many others. Actually, we thank, are taking responsibility. Uh, it's a you, foreign Minister, concept, I understand. Your time has expired. Order. Order on my left. Order. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam um, President. Um, Right now, that we we do we do know that we don't have near enough boots on the ground. That's not going to change. Unemployment is crazy low right now. Have you asked your department at, to look at how we recruit people to do these things? And if so, what models are they considering? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Watt. Um, thanks, Madam President. Uh, I can understand yet again why the opposition is so sensitive about this because they had 10 years to do something about these issues and did nothing. But here we are fixing their mess, making sure that we are properly prepared as a country for natural disasters, making sure that we have a workforce to deal with these events, rather than running around and pretending that climate change isn't real. We're actually taking a responsible approach to this. Um, I might answer your question in two ways, Senator Lambie. The first answer Senator is that I, I have seen myself publicity about the fact that our government intends to launch a recruitment campaign for ADF personnel more generally, but separate to that in the disaster space. As I say, we have made an election commitment to fund one particular organisation uh, to add to the ADF work, which adds itself to the SES and other state-based organisations. We're in discussions with a range of other not-for-profit groups about what can be done, and I'd be more than happy to, to take any views that you have, Senator Lambie, about how we can do this better as a country, because I know that you, unlike a number of other people, are serious about these issues. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Billick. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Last weekend, Australia and Japan signed a joint security declaration. Can the Minister advise the Senate on how the agreement will strengthen our relationship with Japan? Thank you, Senator Billick. Minister. Th thank you, uh, President. And can I thank Senator Billick for her question and, and acknowledge her uh, ongoing interest in foreign policy? And I know she and others share a desire uh, the share, uh, the desire which is mine and many others in this chamber, which is to strengthen Australia's uh, relationship in our region. Uh, Japan, of course, is a special friend of Australia's. Uh, it, it, they are our special strategic partner, uh, and we are natural partners. Uh, and there are many aspects to our partnership. It's, ob it's obviously trade, investment, defence, and security ties bind us. 
uh, but we also have a deep affinity between our peoples and, importantly, shared values, shared values which go to democracy, uh, the defence of human rights, uh, free trade and a rules-based international order. Uh, there is already a very strong relationship with Japan, and I would, in a moment of bipartisanship, recognise that both sides of politics, and parties, governments of both political persuasion over years have invested uh, in the Australia-Japan relationship, and I acknowledge the work of Senator Payne in the period that she was Foreign Minister in that regard. Uh, the government is working to make that relationship stronger. Uh, it was my privilege in my first overseas trip as Foreign Minister to attend the Quad Leaders Summit. Uh, in the first five months of the, the government, the Prime Minister has met Prime Minister Kishida four times, and I have met Foreign Minister Hayashi four times, as well as any other, many other ministerial engagements. And importantly, over the weekend, at the annual Australia-Japan Leaders' Meeting in Perth, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and the Prime Minister of, of Japan, Prime Minister Kishida, signed a renewed joint declaration on security cooperation, a declaration to chart a path for defence and security cooperation between Australia and Japan for the next decade. Our strategic environment is changing you, Minister, and our partnership has, has to evolve. Senator Billick, first supplementary. Thank you for that answer, Minister. Can you also inform the Senate of how the declaration has been updated since 2007? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, as I said, uh, we all know our strategic environment is changing rapidly. Uh, the circumstances the nation faces uh, are more challenging than at any time since World War II. Uh, and in light of that, we have to work together and our partnership with Japan must evolve to meet the growing risks. Uh, uh, and we have to work together to pursue our shared values and strategic interests. So the renewed declaration sets out how Australia and Japan will work together to deepen our strategic partnership as we pursue and help realise a common vision for a free, open and resilient Indo-Pacific, a region that is inclusive, a region that is resilient. The declaration includes collaboration in areas such as climate change, health security, humanitarian assistance, energy transition and disaster response and maritime security. And importantly, leaders also announced that Japan's self-defence forces will train and exercise in northern Thank you, Australia. Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Billick, second supplementary. Thank Thank you, uh, Madam President. Can the minister advise why it matters to the region and to the world for Australia to deepen cooperation with Japan? Minister. Thank you, President. Japan and Australia share a common goal of a region that is stable, that is prosperous, and that is respectful of sovereignty, and a, a world in which differences and disputes are resolved by international law and norms, not simply by power and size. Uh, we also have an interest in nuclear non-proliferation. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida hails from Hiroshima, and he has made clear his aim for pursuing denuclearisation. We share his ambition. And I particularly in this chamber want to underline a very important part of the statement between the, the very important part of the statement between Prime Minister Kishida and Prime Minister Albanese, which was the condemnation of Russia's threat to use <laughs> nuclear weapons against Ukraine. It is serious, it is unacceptable, an unacceptable menace to the peace and security of the international community. And it is important today that I repeat that condemnation here in the Senate chamber. Any use of nuclear weapons will be met with a resolute you, and Minister unequivocal Wong. Your response. Your time has expired, Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Watt. On 13 October, Medibank released a statement confirming it had been subject to a cyber attack and that it was taking offline some data and policy systems to mitigate the impact on customers. On 19 October, a week after Medibank informed its customers, the Minister for Cybersecurity issued a press release. Why did it take the Minister a week to publicly respond to yet another significant cyber incident? Um, Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, Madam President, and thank you, uh, Senator Patterson, for your question. Um, look, I, I, I don't monitor the Minister for Home Affairs diary as closely as Senator Patterson seems to, but what I can tell you is that from the moment this 
breach was reported, the Minister for Home Affairs and the government as a whole has taken action, just like we did in relation to the Optus breach as well. Um, this matter is under investigation uh, by the relevant authorities, including the Australian Signals Directorate and the Australian Federal Police. It's exactly the same approach that we took uh, in relation to the Optus breach, because we do take these issues seriously. Um, we d we, unlike the former government, who spent 10 years doing very little about this, uh, did nothing to address the issue of penalties against corporations who uh, uh, fail to meet uh, consumer expectations around data protection. Um, so now I know that the Minister for Home Affairs and the government as a whole is working closely with Medibank Private uh, to provide all the support possible to help resolve this situation and protect those customers who have been affected. Uh, Medibank Private is receiving ongoing technical advice and assistance from the relevant Australian government agencies, including, as I say, the Australian Signals Directorate and the AFP. Uh, and the AFP has launched Operation Pallidus. Uh, to investigate the Medibank private data breach. Uh, Medibank private advises that it has begun to uh, make direct contact with affected customers, and can I encourage anyone who thinks they may be affected by this recent Medibank private cyber incident uh, should contact 134246, and for Medibank private customers, the number is 132331. Thank you, Minister. Senator Patterson, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. When was the minister first informed of the attack? Senator Watt. Well, I don't think Senator Patterson would, would expect me to know that level of detail about another minister's uh, operations, but I'm happy to take the question on notice. The, um, the, but again, what I do know is that the minister has been Order highly attentive to these issues, as she was uh, for, uh, in relation to the Optus uh, data breach as well. And unlike the former government, uh, we are taking serious action about privacy matters and data breaches by large corporations. We've introduced, we're introducing legislation just this week in only probably, what are we up to, the sixth sitting of parliament? Uh, Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Patterson. Uh, Madam President, I only asked on relevance, I asked the minister when the minister was informed of this attack. He said he didn't know that he would take it on notice. Everything he's added uh, since then is not relevant to the question. Uh, he's in, entitled to continue, but thank you, S Senator Patterson. He has taken it on notice. Minister Watt. Um, it's interesting that Senator Patterson jumps the minute his own former government's record is called into question, and that's because that record was so bad. Uh, unlike the government uh, that was led by those opposite, our government is working closely with businesses, the community and our international partners uh, to progress initiatives that enhance Australia's response to cyber incidents and support a whole of nation uplift in cyber resilience. We take these issues seriously. We're introducing legislation this week to strengthen penalties. Thank you, Minister. What your time has expired, Senator Patterson. Second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the minister for taking the previous question on notice, and I look forward to the answer to that question. Uh, my second supplementary question is: When did the minister first speak to the CEO of Medibank to discuss this attack? Thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister. Uh, happy to take that notice. That question on notice as well. Thank you, Senator Watt. Um, Minister Wong. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Uh, Senator Watt. You have something to say? Okay. Um, thanks, Madam President. I just, I'm not sure if I need to seek leave, but I just wanted to uh, table a response to questions that I took on notice uh, on the 28th of September. Uh, they were questions asked by Senator Roberts. I have written to him and provided the answer to those questions uh, in relation to the Optus data breach, uh, but I thought I should table the answer to, as, to those questions as well. Are there any Motions to take note of answers. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I move to take note of the answers to questions from Liberal and National Senators. Uh, Israel has been a close and dear friend of Australia for decades. Uh, the Israel and the, the Australian-Israel bilateral relationship has been one of the more important pillars in Australia's international relations since the end of the Second World War. It should be remembered that Australia was one of 37 countries that voted in favour of admitting Israel into the United Nations. Even before 1949, Australia's connection to the Jewish homeland dated back to uh, the Great War, which saw Australia's involvement in pushing back the Ottoman Empire as part of the Sinai-Palestine campaign. So therefore, 
it is very disappointing, indeed concerning, that the Albanese Labor government has made the decision to reverse the previous government's decision to no longer continue to recognise West Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. The decision was rushed, not considered properly, and was reckless. Even after reassurance to stakeholders from senior Labor government ministers that there will be no difference in the party's policies, they have still taken this decision and misled the Australian people and indeed the Jewish community. Mr Dreyfus claimed on the 6th of March 2022, the ahead of the May election, that across diplomatic, uh, big opponent, that across domestic politics, Australia spoke with one voice. Mr. Burns, the member for McNamara, on the 18th of March 2022, also ahead of the May election, said that irrespective of who forms government, the Jewish community should feel proud that their interests would be safeguarded. And despite these pre-election assurances, on the 17th of October, media reported. The, for the Department of Foreign Affairs website had removed references to the recognition of West Jerusalem as Israel's capital and the commitment to move the embassy from Tel Aviv. Then, later that day, a spokesperson from Foreign Minister Senator Wong uh, told media that the former government had made the decision to recognise West Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Now, stakeholders, including in the Australian Jewish community, and Israel's ambassador to Australia were also assured that same day by the minister's office that there was no change. But less than 24 hours later, on the 18th of October, the foreign minister announced at a press conference that Australia would reverse the recognition of West Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Labor's announcement occurred on the Jewish holiday, the day of Shimchat Torah, and just two weeks before a heavily contested Israeli election. The Australian government failed to consult with the Australian Jewish community. Indeed, the Israeli ambassador to Australia and Israel's government found out about the announcement from media. Israel's Prime Minister Lapid said, in light of the way in which this decision was made, we can only hope that the Australian government manages other matters more seriously and professionally. And the member for McNamara apologised to the Jewish community for the timing and handling of this appalling announcement. Will the Prime Minister do the same? The Middle East is and remains one of the most strategically important places on the planet. The coalition remains committed to our long-standing position that Australia remains a strong supporter of the two-state solution, in which Israel and a future Palestine state coexist in peace and security within internationally recognised borders. So I urge the Albanese government to apologise to the Israeli Prime Minister Lapid and undo this unwise decision. Lasting peace between Israel and its neighbours is in the interests of every peace-loving member of the international community. After all, we are all God's children. The fact that, Israel, that, that, that uh, Jerusalem is the capital is not just an opinion. It's a fact. Senator Pratt. Well, the opposition has risen to take note of all of the questions they asked of all our ministers today. And it's little wonder, given how they've struggled to find any political or uh, tangible ground on which to mount a political case on any issue today. Whether it's the recognition of West Jer Jerusalem whether it's the Rockhampton Ring Road, whether it's Medibank and cyber security, or whether it is power prices. So I'm going to start today with power prices because it is quite probably the issue of most significant importance to, to most Australians. The government has been working to grapple with rising energy costs unlike those opposite, from whom we saw some 22 energy policies in half a dozen years and as many ministers. Those opposite might like to push aside the fact that they didn't deal with any of these underlying issues when it came to household energy costs 
and simply say, well, what are you going to do about it? Well, the simple fact is we have outlined a very clear platform and a very clear set of energy policies which will create certainty for energy producers, which will create certainty for energy producers who are producing renewable energy, will create certainty for industry and, most importantly, stabilise the system for households. In stabilising the system for households, we are able to look to starting to manage rising energy costs. Many Australians have actually seen their energy costs go down if they've been fortunate enough to have, have been able to directly invest in renewable energy, such as rooftop solar, in their own household. It's this kind of house, individual household vision that we know we need to embrace as a whole nation. It is, of course, not without its complexity, which is why we need a suite of policies, such as rewiring the nation uh, and uh, our electric vehicle policies and a whole range of policies with which we will get more detail in tonight's budget, which are playing a key role and will continue to play a key role into the future in managing household energy costs. There is, of course, a massive uh, tension right across Australian households who are struggling with the rising cost of living. In this budget, I know we will be very mindful of this, but it's very apparent when the opposition seeks to ask questions about power prices and the Australian Energy Regulator that they have little regard for their own record and the lack of attention that they have given this incredibly important issue. We are part of a government on this side that will deal responsibly with the mess that we have before us in energy markets. Our response is not to try and hide price increases as those opposite did. What we saw from those opposite on their watch was in fact Mr Taylor hiding those costs from the electorate right before the election. He didn't dare show Australians the data uh, about their very real household energy costs rising. So is it little wonder that those opposite would now like to take the legacy of those price increases that happened on their watch that households still feel the pain of today and try and cast the blame and legacy uh, for that on our shoulders. Well, we are here for transparency and to address those underlying issues in our energy markets and energy production. Uh, th thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Ch Chandler. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by the Foreign Minister in relation to the appalling decision to insult one of our international partners and allies by refusing to recognise its capital. It speaks volumes that the decision of the Labor government to refuse to recognise the capital of Israel, that their announcement was warmly welcomed by not one, but two prescribed terrorist organisations. Palestinian Islamic Jihad called it a courageous step and a victory. Hamas welcomed Labor's announcement, calling it a step in the right direction. To make things worse, the Israeli government was given no advance warning whatsoever that the Labor government would refuse to recognise their capital. The decision was effectively announced via the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade's website. Then the government spent a day denying that anything had actually changed. Now Senator Wong, in her answer today, says that she had made clear that Labor would take this action. But the fact is, less than 24 hours before making this decision, 
Her office was telling the Israeli ambassador and Jewish stakeholders that no such decision had been made. Yet the very next day, on an important Jewish holiday, the government revealed that it had indeed decided to refuse to recognise West Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. The handling of this announcement was nothing short of atrocious, but it is the substance of the decision which is wrong, unhelpful and insulting. And that is why it has been welcomed by two terrorist groups and met with shock by a friend and an ally. The capital of Israel, according to Israel, is Jerusalem. The idea that Australia should reject Israel's acknowledgement of its own capital is wrong. It does not assist or help the peace process. And it diminishes Australia for our government to refuse to recognise the capital of a friend and ally. The coalition opposes the decision made by the government and supports Australia's continued recognition of West Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Australia is, of course, a strong supporter of a peaceful two-state solution. As has been pointed out by many in recent days, there is no prospect whatsoever that a two-state solution would require the state of Israel to abandon West Jerusalem. The Labor government is wrong to suggest that Australia should deny recognition of Israel's capital until there is a two-state solution, because doing so does not in any way advance that peaceful solution. To the contrary, it can only serve to embolden terror organisations like Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. There are a long list of serious questions to be asked and answered about the making and the announcement of this decision. Aside from Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, whose interests were served by the making of this decision? Who altered the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade's website to remove recognition of West Jerusalem as Israel's capital? And on what basis did they do so, given media reports that a cabinet decision on this matter was made after the website had already been altered? This is a Labor government that is yet to find time to apply sanctions in relation to human rights abuses in Xinjiang. It is yet to find the time to take any diplomatic action in response to the mass murder of women and children in Iran. It has not announced any action to have the Iranian re regime removed from the UN Commission on the Status of Women, but it does have time to sit around the cabinet table and decide to refuse to recognise the capital city of an ally and our partner. Like I said uh, at the start of my remarks, Mr Deputy President, it is an incredibly disappointing decision by the Labor government. The process was wrong, the decision was wrong, and I know myself and many of my colleagues look forward to holding the government to account for this atrocious decision. Senator Billick. Thank you. I too rise to speak on taking note today uh, and I'm also going to speak, as did my colleague, um, in regard to the question that Senator Dunningham asked Senator Wong in regard to electricity prices. And we know that there's been a decade of denial and chaos in energy policy. We know that there's been 22 um, energy policies in, in the last, in, with the previous government in the nine years of the previous government. And we know that none of those were really acted on. And I was a bit surprised that this question actually came from Senator Dunham because Senator Dunham, as a Tasmanian senator, must be aware of the great announcement that uh, Mr Bowen made last week in regard to Marinus Link, which involves um, a cooperation between the Tasmanian Liberal government and the Ta Tasmanian Liberal Pre Premier and the federal government, so which is really it's going to be great for Tasmania, and that's a really important issue. I'll come back to this in a minute. But just to get back to the nine years of the previous government, we've taken the stand that we will deal responsibly with the mess that was left to us in the energy market, the mess we inherited from the other side. So we won't be doing things like um, the previous uh, minister did, uh, the former energy minister did, who I think is now the current shadow treasurer, um, 
He not only knew that electricity prices were skyrocketing, he also ordered that that information be hidden from the Australian people before the election. And I think that speaks volumes about not being honest, about not the other side having not been honest with the Australian people. So I just want to clarify that the member for Hume actually amended the industry code, the electricity for, for um, electricity retailers on the 6th of April, which was four days before the election was called. And so to delay the release of the information of the increases in the default market offered for New South Wales, Queensland and South Australia till after the election, he, uh, he hid that. It's well known, it's really well known everywhere that the previous government left Australia overexposed and underdone. Overexposed to international fossil fuel markets, underdone on the cheapest form of new energy firmed renewables. And our plan, as I said, is to take a steady approach. We've already started working on that. Only last week, Minister Bowen, um, in regard to us trying to get more renewables into the system, include, um, made some announcements. And I'll just talk about a couple of those. Marinus Link. So more than $2.5 billion will go into Marinus Link. It's, um, there'll be access to a concessional loan from rewiring the nation through the Clean Energy Finance Corporation for approximately 80 per cent of the project cost of Marinus Link, with the additional 20 per cent to be an equity investment shared, between, uh, shared equally, as I said, between the Commonwealth and Tasmanian and because Victoria is linked in the Victorian um, parliaments. And that will get this critical project off the ground. And this project will build two undersea transmission cables connecting Tasmania and Victoria. It will mean an estimated 1,400 jobs in my home state of Tasmania, um, 1,400 jobs in Victoria and up to $4.5 billion in positive net market benefits. Marinus Link is expected to cut at least 140 million tonnes of CO2 to 2050, the equivalent of taking approximately one million cars off the road. And yet we get that side because there is a lot of sore losers on that side. We certainly see that in question time, every question time. The interjections, the sniping from the—not all of them, I'll, I'll admit, but um, certainly from where I sit here in the second row, I can hear a lot of them, particularly in the front row and over in that sort of area, sniping. I, don't, I still don't think they've come to accept that they are now the opposition. A number of them, I think they're just like to snipe away at anything, and th this Thank was you. another Thank way you. of doing it. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator Napachimba Price. Thank you, Mr. Acting President. I rise to take note of answers. Uh, are, are, you taking, are you taking the, the motion that's already been moved mm -hmm. to take note of all the responses of Resp the government? So you don't need to move anything if you're wishing to make a contribution. Just wishing to make a contribution yes, with regard you. to um, answers from the minister representing the prime minister yep. uh, with regard to the Rockhampton Ring Road. Yep. Please proceed. Uh, Mr President, we are seeing, beginning to see a pattern emerge here of this government's continual backflipping on commitments that are vital to projects in the regions. For Senator Wong to attempt to belittle the former coalition government's $1 billion plus commitment to the Rockhampton Ring Road as a non-budgeted and undefined commitment when it had already gone to tender is a huge insult, it's a hu and it's an insult to the businesses of Rockhampton and to the families. Labor's delaying of federal funding for the Rockhampton Ring Road is very distressing for the community and driving uncertainty for businesses. The community is crying out for this critical infrastructure project. Businesses in the area now have to hope to win work in the short term, short to medium term, for the Ring Road. 
and Labor members across all levels of government, including local government and state government, must demand that Anthony Albanese deliver this much-needed funding for the Rockhampton region. Because the project would have delivered 14.7 kilometres of ring road with a total of 17, 14.6, with 17.4 of new roadway, incorporating 18 bridges totalling six kilometres in length. The new ring road would have reduced congestion and improved safety to Rockhampton by providing an alternative route, especially for heavy vehicles. But this insult to local businesses and to their families demonstrate that this government has no qualms with abandoning the regions when the regions need them the most. And it is deeply concerning for me, as a representative of the Northern Territory, it is deeply concerning because of the commitments that certainly have been made to the Northern Territory. But it is regional Australia that supports the entire nation in energy production, in agriculture and food, yet this government continues to break promises and instead is making life harder for those in the regions. So I, I, I'm now concerned, what else is this government prepared to slash in the, for the regions in this up and coming bu budget? The Outback Way, linking industries and tourism from Queensland through the Northern Territory over to Western Australia, is a vital piece of infrastructure going forward to three regions. The transport logistics hubs that support our resources sector in the Northern Territory, not only our resources sector for the Northern Territory, but for the entire nation. The transport logistics hubs, do they now hang in the balance? They would support jobs for Alice Springs, Tennant Creek, Catherine, and certainly the communities in between, where, of course, some of our most marginalised Australians live, where some of our mo most marginalised Australians require opportunities to benefit their lives, their lives as well as those in the regions who are, of course, like all other Australians, facing increased prices to their electricity bills. And we've heard another promise again. We heard it over and over again in the lead up to the election, $275 being slashed from everyday Australians' electricity bills. Another promise down the gurgler. So I'm deeply concerned going forward for the regions, for the Northern Territory, some of the places that are out of sight and out of mind to the rest of Australia. But make no mistake, this budget will be propping up the cities, propping up those who already have availability of services and opportunities, and will be propping them up at the expense of those in the regions. This is, not, this is not a happy time going forward for regional Australia, and um, I'm sure that that'll be evidenced later on tonight when we bear witness to how the regions are going to miss out. I'll put the question up to the motion moved by Senator O'Sullivan. Those for the question say aye. Against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Cox. I rise to take note of answers provided by uh, Minister Wong in relation to CSIRO uh, fact sheet. Um, this fact sheet is just another example of the fossil fuel industries trying to buy their social licence and coercing communities in order to prop up what is a dying industry. We know that the fossil fuel industries are well and truly infiltrated the major parties, and that's no secret. What is the most disappointing is seeing this extend to our national um, peak scientific body. And Minister Wong referred to them as uh, an essential piece of infrastructure, a pillar, in fact. So if that is so, then maybe it's time this government committed to, pro to giving adequate funding to CSIRO and restoring what has been cut under the previous government and would actually take us to um, a space where CSIRO would, would not have to take um, a page out of the major parties' playbook and accept money from fossil fuel companies. 
Currently, Australia have the lowest investment in research and development in comparison to other OECD countries. And I hope to see uh, in tonight's budget that that, actually, uh, that investment increases and that the new government take this seriously. And the Greens actually have a policy to increase that to 4 per cent of the GDP under our science uh, portfolio. The fact of the matter is, is that this fact sheet was created to fulfil a recommendation about a fracking inquiry. And the intention was to ensure that First Nations communities were made aware of the risks associated with fracking to basically show, um, well, the extension of respect to make sure that the voices of First Nations people and their ability to uphold their sovereignty, their rights and responsibilities of caring for country were able to be done, making sure that they had all the information that was available to them. And First Nations communities deserve better. And we actually need and demand that accurate information um, that's not funded by companies who want to take and come onto their land and destroy it. Um, we have to talk about free prior informed consent because that shapes what is happening in this country when we talk about manufacturing consent. And this is why the lack of respect that has been shown in relation to the way uh, and the passage that's been provided through CSIRO in providing fact sheets that do provide misleading and, in fact, false information to First Nations communities. And this is why we need to pass uh, Senator Thorpe's private senator's bill in relation to UNDRIPS, and it needs to be a priority. This fact sheet that we, that we speak of says that natural gas development from shale can have some impacts on the environment. So fracking in the Beedaloo Basin alone is allowed to continue. One field could cause up to 117 million tonnes of CO2. And this, in fact, just alone will blow Labor's target of 43 per cent emissions reduction uh, absolutely out of the water. Not to mention the massive amounts of water that, that fracking actually does use. The fact sheet states that fracking uses 99 litres of water for every one litre of chemicals, and that each well can use about eight community swimming pools of water. I mean, that's phenomenal alone. But the Senate inquiry submission um, to the oil and gas exploration and production in the Beedaloo Basin, RAL and Australia Proprietary Limited stated that Sweet Pea actually proposes to drill 10 vertical and hor 10 horizontal wells into each well pad. And they proposed to frack each of these horizontal wells 40 times. So each fracking requires an average of 28 megalitres of water, which is equivalent to 10 Olympic swimming pools. So Sweet Pea intends to use 28 megalitres times 40 wells, uh, times 40 fracks, times 10 wells, um, which equals about 11.2 billion litres of fresh water into each well pad. This is almost the quarter of the entire surface water use in the Northern Territory in one year. And that's just for one sweet pea well pad. There are 27 of these pads planned on this property alone. The issue with water use and fracking cannot be understated, particularly when we are talking about the Northern Territory and the impact in Northern Australia on climate change. This government has a long way to go in terms of, tackling, of taking substantial climate action that is required and committing to no new coal and gas, adequately funding the science industry so our peak national science agency doesn't have to take money from the gas companies, which could compromise their independence and listen to the voices of First Nations people in relation to free prior and informed consent for activities that are occurring on their country. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Senator Cox. I'll put the question to the motion moved by Senator Cox. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes.